So we are very happy to have Mark from UBC, and he will tell us about the uh, Halloween. Please start. Okay. Well, thanks for the invitation, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to to be here. And uh, I I thought I would tell you about some upcoming work. So this is based on a paper that I'm writing currently with my graduate student um, Peter. Simizija, and uh, so I apologize for the untimeliness of the title. It would be great if it were October twenty eighth or twenty ninth at this point. But anyways, I'll hope hope you'll you'll agree that the title is appropriate for what I'm going to talk about. So let's get into that. So starting with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so by now we all know that there's some deep connection in the ADS CFT description of quantum gravity, at least between the entanglement structure of holographic states, which is kind of a, a universal feature of the states. Um, there's a connection between that and the dual space-time geometries and, and some of the gravitational physics. And so I think an interesting question is, how much of quantum gravity or you know how much information about the dual space time and the dynamics is really sitting in these kind of universal properties of, of the quantum mechanical systems that we're using to describe them um, and how much maybe has to do with more specific features of the holographic cfts and so you know we understand through the ryutaki nagi formula for example that areas of certain surfaces uh, correspond to entanglement entropies of subsystems. Um, but what about the, the matter fields in the geometry? If you, if you go beyond the metric, um, you know, are those possibly captured by universal properties of the state as well? Or the internal space geometry, is that captured by, um, by something universal? Or is that always to do with some specific features of the, the theory that you're talking about? Mark? Yeah. Could you just clarify what you mean by universal? Yeah, so I will. Um, so what I mean is that, you know, different holographic CFTs, they have different um, operators. And, and so uh, universal quantities, I would say, are quantities that we can talk about without ref reference to the specific operator content of the theory. So for example, the entanglement structure, the entanglement entropy of a subsystem is something that is, is universal because it's something that I could ask about for any holograph, any CFT, um, whereas the, the um, correlator of some specific operator with a certain dimension would be a specific property of, of a CFT. Okay. Um, so I'll emphasize that a little bit more later. Um, so I want to talk today, maybe the, the, the talk today is motivated by exploring an extreme possibility, which is that, you know, maybe the precise microscopic degrees of freedom that we're using to describe our, our quantum gravity theory um, are kind of unimportant. And the actual Hamiltonian that we're using is kind of unimportant. Maybe we can, if we want to describe some gravitational physics that we would usually describe using one holographic CFT, maybe, it's, maybe we could actually use some other holographic CFT. And if we just put that in, in the right quantum state with the right kind of universal properties, then we can, we can also describe the same space-time in all its details, including all the fields. Okay. Um, and so this is the, the connection to the title. Um, I want to ask the question, can we dress up CFT2 to look like some appropriate, some state that we've chosen of CFT1? Okay, so let me be a little bit more precise here. Um, so, so when I'm talking about a state of CFT1, I have in mind some particular state at some time. And, you know, given the Hamiltonian of CFT1 and this state, then we have sort of a complete dual space-time. Um, but I want to be a little bit more careful and just say, you know, what is the part of the space-time which is encoded just in that state? Um, and so for that, we can think of, or the maybe 
conventional by this point view would be that the state itself would encode, say, this causal region of, uh, uh, that I've drawn here, uh, the domain of dependence on some spatial slice, which ends on the time slice where your state is defined. Um, so for example, if I were to make us a, a change in the Hamiltonian at some t equals epsilon, well, that would have effects on the geometry outside of this, um, of this causal domain. And so I, I, I don't want to say that the state is dual to the entire space time, rather that if I, if I just have the state and maybe don't know exactly what's going to happen to ha the Hamiltonian afterwards, um, then I'm encoding this, this kind of causal region. And so then what I want to ask is, can I find a state of CFT2, some other CFT, um, where the, the space-time dual to that state includes like an arbitrarily large portion of that causal region. Okay, so let me start with kind of an ob obvious objection to that, uh, and it relates to uh, something I mentioned earlier. So we have in ADS CFT this understanding that on the gravity side you have a metric, but then also various matter fields, gauge fields, etc. Um, and the specific fields that appear on the gravity side are associated with specific light operators in the CFT. Okay, and specifically, the you know the asymptotic behavior of these fields in any in any um, geometry that would be described by your CFT is gonna be related to the short distance correlators of these specific operators in this CFT. Okay. And so then an obvious question is, well, how could I hope to describe this same space time with this set of fields using some other CFT that might have a completely different operator spectrum? Okay. Um, so at first, you know, it, what I'm suggesting sounds implausible, but one key point to keep in mind is that different semi-classical theories of gravity, so different kind of low energy descriptions, they can be part of the same non-perturbative theory. So even though CFT2 might have a set of light operators that correspond to like a different set of fields than the ones we started with, we could have this sort of picture where some state that we find of CFT2 um, maybe has an asymptotic region, which, is, which has fields associated with the light operators of CFT2. But then maybe there's some interior region, which is actually described by the semi-classical theory associated with CFT1. And then in between these two regions, we could imagine that there's some dynamical interface brain, which is part of this some larger non-perturbative theory that includes both of these semi-classical theories um, as possible low energy descriptions. Uh, Mark? Yeah. Uh, are you saying that this is like, um, like an RG flow? So this, <clears throat> this one, the CFT2 flows to CFT1 in the yeah, infrared? Yeah, so, or? so I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Um, what I, what I want to do here is think about a, like a Lorentzian picture where I could choose a different state of CFT2. So if I had a state of CFT2, which is the vacuum state, then it would just be some, some ADS space time with, with you know, this, whatever cosmological constant appears in this darker gray region, and that would extend all the way in. But what, so, so what I wanna do is choose some other state of CFT2, which somehow mimics the properties of the vacuum state of CFT1, or whatever state of CFT1 I started with. Okay, so I, I just arrange the degrees of freedom in what might, be, what might be sort of an unnatural way. Maybe this costs me a bunch of energy, um, but I arrange them so that maybe the degrees of freedom are entangled in a way that looks like this CFT1 state. And then the hope would be that if I do that um, in just the right way, that this state of CFT2 now kind of encodes a geometry that actually in includes a big part, a big part of the original geometry that I started with. So the, the red, the red circle is the costume that the so CFT the red, puts on. I guess. Yeah. I mean, the, the CFT is in the, the IR is sort of the costume, you know, the, the, the costume extends down to uh, this part is the UV. You can't really hide that. You can't really dress that up, but, but the, um, 
the, the sort of IR physics of, C, of the CFT2 um, state is supposed to look like the IR physics of the CFT1. So in that sense, morally, it's like the RG flow picture, um, but we're talking about just choosing a specific state rather than having a theory that flows down. And maybe I should patiently let you get to where you're going, but this is very interesting. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, in, in this wheel of the bit patch you were showing initially, yeah. you could have a fairly complicated scattering process where a small black hole forms and evaporates, for example. And is, is the work in, so, so something has, I mean, so there's a lot of detailed information in, this, in the scattering matrix uh, in, in such a process. Is that work of spitting out the correct scattering matrix done by, the, by this brain that you're putting there? Or is it going to be uh, all in the way that these fields are constructed out of the um, effective degrees of freedom that you're in discovering in your CFT2? Yeah, so this, this is, I, it's, it's somehow, um, somehow that dynamics, which you think of as being, you know, described by the dynamics of the CFT1 Hamiltonian. Um, I guess what I'm suggesting is that maybe it can also be described by the CFT2 Hamiltonian. Maybe the, the encoding is going to be fairly complicated. So the question you have to ask to extract it may be fairly complicated, you know, similar to how asking questions about behind the black hole horizon are it is, it turns out to be a very complicated question about a CFT. Um, but I guess part of the, the vision that this is exploring is that you know, maybe, maybe the, the physic, this physics of gravity is more universally present in, in these CFTs and doesn't require a specific Hamiltonian um, maybe somehow you can uh, you can you can find it um, in various possible Hamiltonians. Uh, but let me, yeah, I, it'll be more clear what I'm what I'm doing as we proceed. Okay, um, so you know one one key part of this picture is that well, if I have CFT one and CFT two and and they have some corresponding low energy theories of gravity, um, if this picture is going to work, then, you know, we need those two low energy theories of gravity to be part of the same theory. And that theory has to have some interface brain that can go from one low energy description to another low energy description. Um, you know, and of course, this is not a surprise from the point of view of, of string theory models. This is something that, um, that we're all familiar with, um, especially Raphael. Um, and, and so it's, you know, maybe not not so surprising, um, but I guess, it, so a question it is, um, how do I know if I have, say, two holographic CFTs and there's some corresponding theories of gravity that look different from each other, how would I know if those two theories of gravity can be connected in this way? Um, how do I know if there's some nar larger non-perturbative theory that would have such a brain? Okay. Um, and so I guess one thing that I want to suggest is that um, having these two theories of gravity be connected and, and, and being part of a larger non-perturbative theory with, with this interface brain, you know, that sounds really difficult to, to, to check or, or understand. Um, but I think it's actually related to a much simpler criterion that you could ask about the CFTs themselves. Um, and so a suggestion is that Suppose I have these two theories of, of gravity, gravity theory one, which is kind of dual to CFT one and gravity theory two, which is dual to CFT two. Um, then I think it's kind of reasonable that as long as I can couple these two physical theories at an interface, then those two gravity theories should actually part, be part of the same theory. Okay, so, I mean, this sounds very hard, coupling to, you know, finding some non-perturbative theory of gravity, which has these two low energy descriptions as part of it. Um, whereas this sounds kind of easy, like you take two physical systems and you want to stick them together in such a way. And what I mean by non-trivially is that some energy could pass from one CFT to the other. Okay, so, so let me give the, you know, why am I saying this? So imagine that we have some interface between CFT1 and CFT2. You know, maybe I've started with a lattice description of each of those theories and, and then just made the lattices uh, intersect at some point. 
or maybe I started with some UV um, quantum field theory description of these CFTs, and then I just have some interaction between the fields in one quantum field theory and the fields in the other at an interface. Okay. Um, so somehow I've ended up defining this theory, which is, has the degrees of freedom of CFT1 on one side and CFT2 on the other side, and, and they interact. Um, so uh, can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, what's, the, what's the, yeah, again, going back to RGE, what's the really uh, difference of saying that uh, two different theory goes to uh, same infrared fixed point? And this flow, usually in perturbative theory, you don't care states, right? I mean, the theory coupling constant runs, but at this level, it depends on states, right? Because you're cost graining states. And then like low energy theory, living on the moving boundary also changes. Namely, degrees of freedom changes from G prime to G, because you say pi prime to pi. And it goes to a uh, same infrared fixed, or, 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 or that's exactly what you're talking about? Uh, look, oh, maybe let me finish the slide and, and then maybe it'll be clear. Um, so I, what I'm saying here is, you know, so this is a little bit different than my picture with the bubble. Oh yeah, here that, that's the one I, I was talking. Yeah. yeah, here I'm just saying, you know, suppose you, suppose you define a different system with, the, with these two, F, two CFTs, they're both present in the same theory, but now on different sides of an interface. Uh -huh. And now I do this thing where I imagine um, exciting CFT1 at some place, and because they're, they're coupled, then eventually the excitation that I place on CFT1 will be felt in CFT2. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now, supposing that both of these theories are holographic, then there's some kind of dual description. And we start out with, say, a gravity wave, gravitational wave in this region that's near the asymptotic, the CFT1 asymptotic boundary. But then eventually, we find that there are gravity waves in this other region of space-time described by a different mm -hmm. semi-classical theory of gravity. And so to me, that says, you know, if there's a, that in the gravity side description of this, those two theories of gravity or those, mm -hmm. those two space-time regions must be connected in some way so that energy or, or excitations could pass from one to the other. But so it's of course- kind of mo Motivated by previous picture of the annulus thing. And then you try to figure out the property of this brain. Uh, and, and this is a simpler way. Yeah, it seems much simpler to actually have the brain extend all the way out to the boundary. If you wanted to sort of classify what types of brains are possible, mm -hmm. then it seems much simpler to have it extend all the way out to the boundary. And, okay, thank you. And, um, so I guess, you know, the final point that I didn't quite emphasize yet is that in gravity, if there's some interface between two space-time regions, then it should be something dynamical. I mean, just in general, everything in gravity, uh, the metric itself in gravity would be a dynamical variable. And so the, the shape of the, of the brain would be generally be expected to be able to vary. Yeah. So, so this could switch you from whatever super young mills with, uh, SUN to SUN plus one or something. Would that be an example? Yeah. So I mean, that would be a very that would be a very mild example, and and um, we actually understand uh, very well the the gravity solutions that would be dual to that example. People have found um, tendy solutions, but I think an interesting point of this is you know suppose that you you thought you had some totally new way of defining quantum gravity, um, and you know I think just general principles of ADS CFT suggests that you should be able to define a CFT, which would be dual to your new theory of quantum gravity, assuming that it has an ADS um, vacuum. Uh, and then you could just take the CFT that's dual to what you think is your new theory of quantum gravity and just couple it to N equals four super Yang Mills theory. And, and now on the CFT side, you have energy that can go from one CFT to the other. So that suggests that somehow this, new, this thing you thought was a different theory of quantum gravity maybe is somehow connected to string theory or type 2b supergravity. Um, okay, of course, you know, maybe there are CFTs where for some reason it's impossible to, to couple them together. Maybe you try at the level of the lattice, but then once you get to the continuum picture, um, the interface actually becomes... Uh, I think reflecting is the jargon where, where you actually can't ever pass excitations from one CFT to the other. But um, I don't know of any reason why that would be true. I don't know. I mean, it's usually harder to insulate one thing from something else um, than, than to, 
to couple it. Um, so I get to, for this talk, kind of put aside this question of, of whether any two CFTs can be coupled together and whether there's just sort of one um, quantum gravity theory. Uh, for this talk, what I want to do is just assume that my CFTs are of this type, that I have some consistent interface where the two CFTs can be coupled to one another. Um, and I want to focus on the question of how would I construct a specific state of CFT2 that would model or, or um, approximate a given state of CFT1? Okay. Um, any questions before I get to the meat of it then? I have a question. Yeah. Are you going to connect two CFTs with different central charges also? Yes, I will. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Um, so what I want to do is actually tell you about a very explicit construction of given a CFT1 state, I'll tell you a specific CFT2 state that I could construct. And then I want to talk about the gravity dual interpretation of that state. Okay. Um, so here's the mapping. This is kind of the, the slide with the, the, the basic map that I will be using where I start from the Hilbert space of CFT1, say on a sphere, and I map to the Hilbert space of CFT2, which is also on a sphere. Um, and so I wanted to find this operator, which depends on um, what these two things. Uh, so what, are the, what the operator is, is, um, is you can think of it as being defined by some, by its matrix elements. And the matrix elements I'm gonna define by a Euclidean path integral. Okay. So remember CFT1 and CFT2 are two CFTs that can be coupled non-trivially at an interface. Okay, so the, the interface is labeled by I. In general, as I'll mention in the next slide, there can be many choices of interface that couple two different theories. So there's some choice that we have to make there and I'll label that choice by I. And then I'm going to have a small parameter epsilon here. And, um, and so the matrix elements of this operator between a CFT1 state and a CFT2 state would be defined by this path integral where I kind of put, um, say, the, the fields of my CFT1 um, in the desired configuration on this side and the fields of my CFT2 in the desired configuration on the other side. And then I integrate over the field configurations on this interface. Okay. Um, so in terms of operator language, um, then the Euclidean, so, so you can think of this as sort of Euclidean time. Um, so I start with a CFT1 state and then I evolve for a little bit of Euclidean time, epsilon one. I'm gonna take that to zero in the end. And now at some Euclidean time, my Hamiltonian, it changes from the Hamiltonian of CFT1 to the Hamiltonian of CFT2. Okay. And so that in operator language defines some kind of quench operator. If I do that quench, I'm going to end up with, so, that, so this is something <clears throat> where it's like I'm jumping directly from a state of CFT1 and, and now I've just changed the Hamiltonian. So it's, it's like, um, it's like this sudden approximation in quantum mechanics. But in quantum field theory, this is kind of ill-defined. Um, and we would expect that after I perform this quench, I get some infinite energy state of CFT2. Okay, because maybe the UV structure is still that of a finite energy U CFT1 state, um, but, but that UV structure is different than we would need for a finite energy state of CFT2. And so now I apply a little bit of Euclidean evolution with respect to the Hamiltonian of CFT2, okay? And this e to the minus epsilon h2 is going to smooth everything out and give at, in, the, in the UV and give me a finite energy state of CFT2. Um, but the whole point is, you, you know, the hope is that if epsilon is small, then the long distance properties of this state should be more or less like they were before. We don't have enough Euclidean evolution to really affect the infrared very much. Um, so that's the, this is the basic idea. Okay. And yeah, so I'll just go back a little bit to this point of, of the interfaces. Um, how should I think about the interface between 
if, if I have these two different CFT one, CFTs, maybe with different central charges and different operators and so forth, you know, how do I know what possible interfaces there are? So a useful way to think of that is that interfaces between CFT1 and CFT2 um, by what's called the folding trick that I think is due to Ian Affleck. Um, you can think of those as just boundary conditions for a tensor product CFT, where you have the CFT1 and then tensored with um, kind of the mirror image of this CFT, which could be the same thing. So I, I can imagine this tensor product CFT where the two CFTs are not interacting. And then I could define that, try to define that on a half space um, and ask what are the consistent boundary conditions for that theory? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Mark, how is this related to BCFTs? I mean, are yeah. you making them BCFTs now and so, identifying the boundary or? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that, um, a, you know, a, a BCFT where the bulk CFT is this tensor product that could be identified with an interface CFT between CFT1 and CFT2. So essentially by folding it, you, you would have a consistent um, BFC, uh, BCFT. Okay, assuming that this, so this assumes that this interface actually, that we're in the infrared and this, this whole theory has a scale invariance. Um, I and think so you're, asser you're asserting that your folded picture here is, I mean, you're saying, just think of that as a BCFT to start with. And uh, it's just that these two CFTs share a boundary from the beginning. It's kind of a bit unusual, I think, because usually I think, and th this is not a manifold with boundary, is it? Well, okay, so, so this is, a, okay, so, so this theory, the way I wanna think of it is I start with a, a bulk CFT, which is CFT1 tensor CFT2. So this now lives on, say, the entire plane. And now I want to define that theory on a manifold with boundary. Okay. And prior to adding the boundary, the fields in CFT1 didn't interact with the fields in CFT2. And for some choices of boundary condition, the fields, I just choose a separate boundary condition for CFT1 and CFT2. Okay, so some choices of boundary condition will just give you BCFT1 times BCFT2. But I think there are other choices of boundary conditions in general where you actually end up having the two theories interact because of the boundary condition. Okay. So this is well known, um, for example, if you take two copies of the Ising CFT, then it's known what all the boundary conditions are. And most of them, most of the consistent boundary conditions actually make the two theories interact. Okay. Um, so I guess you know, one of the reasons that I'm, that I'm emphasizing this picture is that um, there's at least an in principle kind of bootstrap that would allow you to figure out what are all of the consistent boundary conditions for a CFT. And so there's sort of in, in principle um, method that we could use to determine whether CFT1 and CFT2 have a non-trivial interface. And it would be you know, some, some bound, BCFT version of this bootstrap. Okay, now, um, so there are many different choices of boundary condition or, or interface. Um, one useful parameter that I'm going to be referring to a bunch in this talk is this idea of an interface entropy. So this is simply a boundary entropy in this picture. And one way to define this is to say that um, you consider your interface CFT. So this is a, a one plus one D picture, but there's similar things that can be defined in higher dimensions. So I consider my interface CFT and I look at the vacuum state of that and I evaluate the entanglement entropy of an interval that's length L on one side and length L on the other side. And then you can show, well, this BCFT picture shows that there's a universal form of the answer that has a bulk contribution and then there's some finite boundary contribution. And so this is a parameter that's associated with the interface. And roughly it's like a boundary version or an interface version of the central charge. Larger values of this log G you can think of as some interface that maybe has more degrees of freedom. Okay, sorry, I'm just checking my... Sorry, where, where the two inside the log comes from? It comes from... 
actually I'll, well, I'll show you a holographic picture of where it comes from. I mean, this is just, if, if you do the CFT calculation with the replica trick, um, this is the answer that you get for, for a BCFT. I mean, in general, for a BCFT, it would be C over six log of 2L over epsilon plus log of G. Um, and in this case, my, my CFT is this tensor product, and the, so the central charge is the sum of the two. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. But this, this dot is a forwarding, right? Red dot is a forwarding. I thought that the yeah, left yeah, that, is a I mean, the red dot, right I've, gone, the I've gone back to this picture yeah. here. So yeah, if it yeah. were folded, then it would just be a single interval, which includes the boundary. Yeah, that's why I didn't understand L, uh, too well, but yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the state that you're using for entropy? A vacuum state. This, this would be for the vacuum entanglement entropy. It's like vacuum of one tends to vacuum of two? Well, it's, it's the, the vacuum of the interacting theory. So if, yeah. So, sorry. Um, so if I consider like two regions, one is in the total left and another is like on the right yeah. and they're disconnected. So my, sub, my subsystem is the entire region, including the interface. And so I want to take the entropy of that entire subsystem. So, so if I don't include the uh, this red point in my regions, and if I look at two regions, one is on the left of my red dot, another is on the right of the red dot, yes. will I get any log g correction to that? Or? Yeah, so that's a that's a a quantity that's generally not universal. Um, if I if I were to take, I mean, it's kind of like the multiple interval case in a in a regular CFT. Um, then the answer can be complicated. So if, if my region is exactly what I'm showing you, then the answer takes a universal form. It's the same for any CFT up to this, um, you know, up to these constants. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so what I wanna do is um, now focus on, I'm going to focus on um, a particular state of CFT1, which is the CFT1 vacuum. We'll talk about more general states later. And now I want to apply my kind of you, this quench operator, act on the CFT1 vacuum, and, and that defines my state of CFT2. So in other words, my state of CFT2 is, because the, the vacuum of CFT1, I can define it using a path integral where the Euclidean time goes to minus infinity. And then I add on my CFT1 to CFT2 mapping operator. And then the whole thing looks like this. Okay. So this is the state of CFT2 that I'm interested in. And then I want to understand, say, what would the dual geometry to that be? Okay. Um, so when you have states that are defined by path integrals, then often there's a nice kind of ADS CFT algorithm to figure out what the dual geometry is. And I'll just remind you of that. So if I want to do calculations of, of various observables in this state that I've defined, then I would use this CFT path integral and maybe insert some operators here at, at time equals zero. Um, and then using ADS CFT, this path integral should correspond to a gravity path integral. And Usually that would be dominated by some saddle point, which would be a solution of the corresponding gravity equations whose asymptotic behavior uh, is governed by this picture. Okay. So I wanna find um, okay, a solution of, of this gravity theory. But now of course this gravity theory has one low energy description associated with CFT2, one and another low energy description associated with CFT2. Um, and then you know, these are connected so somehow by an interface brain. And even without talking about the details of that bigger theory with the interface brain, we can, we can see that sort of topologically, you have these two possibilities for the topology of this interface. Okay, so just even without telling you any kind of details of, of, uh, of my dual theory, um, you could see that, well, I could, I could have a situation where the low energy gravity one theory um, 
is a good description throughout the symmetrical time equals zero slice, in which case I would have a disconnected interface or two interfaces. Okay. Or I could have a situation like this where these two, you know, the, the interface on the boundary, which is disconnected, actually connects up in the bulk. Okay, so uh, these Mark? are, yes. Sorry, I, I think I don't understand the first of these two pictures. Okay. Uh, I mean, the first of the two on the right. Um, uh, let me consider a simpler operator that I could put in on the boundary, one which creates a neutron star in the center of, of ADS or something like that, or just a particle, right? So that kind of evolution where, you know, I have something and then in the center of ADS, uh, sorry, I, I don't have anything and suddenly I have something isn't consistent with, um, you know, for example, the constraint equations of, well, so, of GR. But, so here- hmm. uh, It's you... important that this is a Euclidean picture. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, here it's... It looks so Lorentzian, I'm confused. Yeah, it's, it looks Lorentzian. So th this is the Euclidean... Okay, so, so we, we remember that the vacuum state is defined by a Euclidean path integral um, where I evolve with e to the minus beta h and then beta goes to infinity. And my operator m is defined using a Euclidean evolution. And so, so, so far everything is you know, my state is entirely defined by a Euclidean path integral. Um, what I'm going to do in the end is slice these Euclidean geometries at the symmetric point, and that will give me the initial data for my Lorentzian space-time. So that's, that, yeah, that's a very important point. Um, so, Unfortunately, I'm still confused. So how does okay. it help that it's Euclidean? I mean, it, it still seems inconsistent okay. to, to do something that's going to change things instantaneously deep in the bulk, Euclidean or Lorentzian, or am I getting that wrong? Um, you know, so if, if you have, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like if you have a Euclidean Wilson loop or something and you wanted to do that calculation, it would just be some, th there would be some surface in the bulk. Um, and you wouldn't worry that, I don't know, I don't think you'd worry about causality issues. There's probably a better thing I could say here. Well, um, I mean, th w one thing you can do are these sort of, uh, um, time folds, right? I mean, the issue here is, right, if you consider a slice just below the first of these red slices um, and you consider its wheel at a width patch, it seems to go through the red slice in the bulk and be inconsistent with it. But that, yeah, again, the Wheeler DeWitt patch here, I, I shouldn't think of until I go to the Lorentzian picture. And so, it, so in this picture, it, as I'll say, let me actually draw the next. In this picture, if, if I actually look at, say, the time equals zero slice here, um, on the left picture, you see that's entirely described by gravity theory. Oh, I think it should say, well, no, two, that's right. Uh, I, I've... I've got these mixed up. This should say grav one and this should say grav two. Okay, so, so in this picture, in the Lorentzian theory, it's just a slice of ADS with you know, the parameters associated with CFT2. And so there's really nothing there. Um, whereas in this picture, if I slice at t equals zero, then I have my interface brain. There's some interior region which looks like gravity theory one and my exterior region that looks like gravity theory two. Thanks. Um, I, I, okay. I get it now. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the, basically the, the point of this is that I have these two possibilities for top topologically with my Euclidean solution dual to this CFT setup could look like if it turns out that this possibility is realized, then the Lorentzian geometry is like the one that I promised that has a part of the gravity theory dual to CFT1 describing the interior of some bubble and the asymptotic region looks like gravity theory two. If this possibility is realized, then the entire t equals zero slice, which gives me the initial data for my Lorentzian solution would just be look like the dual of CFT2. So we would have failed to describe a portion of space-time that looks like the dual of CFT1. Do you, do you care a stability of the right? 
because instantaneously yeah. true. Yeah. So but I mean, what was we'll shrink right away? Yeah, that's that's right. The bubble is going to shrink. Um, but if you remember, you know, my my initial hope was really just to describe a portion of the Wheeler DeWitt patch. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I have the original Wheeler DeWitt patch and I want to describe a portion of that Wheeler DeWitt patch, well, that's going to be inside a shrinking bubble. Yeah. Um, but I'll I'll still be happy with that. Okay. Okay. So indeed, the bubble is dynamical. Okay. Um, okay. So then, kind of the meat of of the project in terms of um, calculations, what we wanted to do was investigate in a in the context of a specific model where we could calculate things which of these two possibilities is realized? Um, and you know, how does that depend on the ratio of the central charges and properties of the interface and this parameter epsilon? Yeah. So our model is kind of the simplest thing you could imagine. We, have, we imagine that um, the theory dual to this interface, jump, this interface CFT um, has Einstein gravity with some relevant cosmological constant on, on each side in the bulk, and we choose the cosmological constant or the ADS lengths to correspond to the central charges of the CFT. And then we're going to just take the very simplest possible thing that we can for the interface. We just imagine this is something that couples gravitationally on either side, and it has some interface tension, um, which is described by this parameter kappa. And so it's, it's kind of similar to um, models for BCFTs that have been discussed by Takianagi and Karch and Randall. Um, so of course we could have more complicated models where the interface brain is say coupling to other fields um, or you know, microscopically, if we ha actually had a, a 10D theory in the bulk, um, then this interface brain might actually just represent a transition region where the internal space geometry is one thing on one side, and then it makes a transition over some length scale. And, and then on the other side, it's some other, um, some other internal space. Okay. So, so that's what happens in, in, say, some of the microscopic solutions that would be dual to n equals 4 with different values of n on either side of an interface. Um, OK. So that's the, that's the model. Um, one of the interesting things we can do right away is relate this tension parameter to this interface entropy parameter that I was mentioning before as a prop property that characterized the interfaces. Okay. And so I said that the interface um, entropy parameter is something that I can calculate by looking at the vacuum state of my theory and then calculating the entanglement entropy of some interval that includes the interface. Okay. And so if you, if you take this simple gravity model, and then you know, first we want to find what is the dual of the vacuum state of this simple setup here. So then it turns out that that's just two parts of the, in this case, I'm using the sort of Poincaré description of ADS. Okay, so we could think of there being two parts of my geometry, each of them is a part of Poincaré ADS, and, and then we identify the two parts um, along this red line, which is the interface brain. And so you need to put in your, your cosmological constants and your tension, and then you solve the gravitational equations, which basically reduce to just some, some Israel junction conditions. Um, and you find that these angles here are determined in terms of all of your parameters, L1 and kappa and L2. Okay. So this is generally what it looks like. Um, and, and then you, you glue those together. Okay. Um, and then once you have that geometry, you can compute this entanglement entropy. Um, and, and so it turns out that geometrically, so remember, the, there was a formula for the entanglement entropy that was sort of a bulk part plus log g. And so it turns out that the bulk part is exactly the area of this plus the area of that. So we subtract that off. And then what's left, the area that remains, is, is the interface entropy. So geometrically, the interface entropy is the area of this 
region here and the area of this region here of the RT surface. And, uh, and, and that, that gives you some formula for log G in terms of all these parameters. Okay, I'll, I won't write the formula. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll mention that the formula relates some specific interval of tensions to the full range of possible boundary entropies. Okay. So, so this kappa parameter, just in terms of gravity, you wouldn't really know what to take it as. But once you do this calculation relating the interface entropy to gravity parameters, you realize that there's this specific range of, of tension values that give you all of the possible um, boundary entropies. Okay, so that's the range that we'll be considering. So given two specific CFTs, we have a choice of interfaces, and on the gravity side, that will translate to a choice of kappa parameters. Um, what fixes theta one and theta two? Uh, what so theta one is a function of L one, L two, and kappa. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so you know, so now we're ready to uh, to go ahead and try to find the solutions which are dual to this more complicated setup, and. Because I've chosen to work with interfaces which only couple gravitationally, and because I'm in a situation which, which is spherically symmetric, then the geometries that I need are just parts of either pure ADS or Schwarzschild ADS. Okay. So I'm, I've chosen a model that where everything, uh, everything is going to be relatively simple. And so essentially the only thing you need to do is solve these junction conditions to figure out uh, what the trajectory of the interface brain looks like. And so these, these two possible kinds of solutions uh, in a little bit more detail. So there are these pure ADS solutions where I have, here's the ADS cylinder with, with ADS length L1, and here's the ADS cylinder with ADS length L2. And so I could have some region of this one, which is glued into this region of this one. And so that that gives me my first kind of solution where I had a, a layer of the ADS with length L2 inside an ADS with length L1. Those were the solutions that we weren't really interested in. And then the other solutions, what happens is that you have a part of the pure ADS space with ADS length L1, and then the, the kind of exterior geometry, the geometry in this, in this ring, um, is a part of Schwarzschild ADS. So we have an extra parameter mu in this exterior geometry. Um, so, so this is the, the Euclidean time coordinate in the Schwarzschild ADS. It's periodic if we want, uh, if we want everything to be smooth at the horizon. Um, and then we just have a, a portion of that. And so sometimes you have a portion that includes the horizon and sometimes you have a portion that doesn't include the horizon. And so you take that and you just glue it into there along the red surface. Okay. So it's not very hard to find all these solutions. Actually, a, a, a paper recently by uh, Fu and Maralf on bag of gold space times did very similar calculations with a different purpose. Okay. And so what we want to do is just find all the allowed solutions with, with these different gravity parameters. Um, so one thing I should mention is that in order to end up with um, this particular parameter epsilon, which you can think of as the ratio between this height and the radius of the sphere, you need to choose the right value of mu. Okay. So going from the CFT parameters to the gravity parameters, you know, we choose L based on the central charges, we choose kappa based on log G, and then we have to choose mu um, based on getting this particular epsilon that was a parameter in, in defining our state. Okay. Sometimes there can be different values of mu that correspond to the same value of epsilon. And so then you have to compare different solutions. Okay, so you find these different solutions. Sometimes there's more than one. Uh, then as usual, you have to compare the actions to find the least action solution. 
Mark, could you just go back uh, one slide? Yeah. Um, so there's in, in, the, in the bottom right picture, um, there's yeah. a horizon radius. And so we have some, uh, asymptotically, we would already have some mass, some non-zero mass because, because of that. Yes. And, then there's, and then there's some uh, brain that surrounds this black hole in some sense, or how should I think of this red line? Is it like a spherical brain that surrounds the black yeah, hole? Yeah, let me, let me jump ahead to the, okay. Let me just jump ahead to the Lorentzian picture here. Oh, okay, good. So, um, so for, for these solutions here, which have, a, which have the um, black hole, then you have sort of two possibilities where in one case, the brain is something that falls into the horizon eventually. And in the other case, is that this is the case where your Euclidean solution actually includes the Euclidean horizon, um, then the brain is actually always behind the black hole horizon. Okay. Um, in your first picture that we were looking at a couple slides back, uh, that one, yeah. Yeah. Which is it supposed to be clear which of these two cases that corresponds to? Yeah. So let me let me say how we think of the. Lorentzian geometry. So I want to take the time equals zero slice yeah. and then look at that geometry. So the time equals zero slice in either case, it includes this disc or, or this sphere, or I should say ball of pure ADS. And then you get to the interface brain. And then in this case that I've depicted, then you, you go from the interface brain out to the black hole or out to the ADS boundary and the radius always increases. If this boundary actually went on this side, what would happen is that you'd have your ADS bubble, you'd get to the interface brain, and then the geometry would sort of shrink down to a horizon and then expand out to the ADS boundary. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Um, okay, so. So finally, let me, sh let me show you then some results. So I, I wanna focus on the case where this parameter epsilon is small. Remember that was, that was the parameter that controlled the amount of Euclidean evolution. We wanted to keep that small in order not to affect the infrared physics very much. Um, and so sm for small epsilon, we can draw this phase diagram where the horizontal axis corresponds to the number of degrees of freedom of CFT2. Okay, so let's imagine we fix the central charge of CFT1, and then we can consider a CFT2 with either a smaller central charge. Sorry, this is, it's, a, it's kind of reversed. So we have C1 over C2. Um, so on the right-hand side, this is when the CFT2 has less degrees of freedom. And this is when we're approximating our original theory with a CFT that has more degrees of freedom. And so one of the interesting things then is that if you have more degrees of freedom, so if you're trying to approximate, you know, n equals four with gauge group U100 with a gauge group U200, um, then you always have the black hole solution being the lowest action. So if you have more degrees of freedom in the theory, then, um, then you're always successful, regardless of what you choose for this interface tension or for the, for the interface um, ent entropy, okay? And you have various, you know, depending on the, the tension, uh, you might find that the bubble is inside the horizon or you might find that it's outside the horizon, okay? Now, if your CFT that you're using to approximate the original state has less degrees of freedom, um, well, then, then you have some restrictions. So you seem to need to choose a large enough interface entropy or a large enough tension in order to have the bubble solution be the correct one, okay? But that's still fine. Um, you know, the choice of parameter just eventually goes into the choice of state. So this suggests that as long as my C2 is bigger than one third of the central charge of the original theory, I can find a state that, um, that approximates a large patch of, of the original ADS space time, okay? Um, Mark? So, yeah. I'm a little surprised that, so 
a naive interpretation of this diagram, right, would be to say that in some sense, the boundary entropy is making up for the dumbness of the CFT2. If the CFT2 has less degrees of freedom, the boundary entropy somehow fills in. But, but then you might have thought that, you know, there is no limit to how, how dumb the CFT2 can be. Whereas you're finding that, you know, if it's like a third as, as dumb as CFT1, then it, the game is over. Uh, yeah. Is there, so, so it's not the intuition is completely wrong about the or. Okay. So yeah, good question. Um, so I'll say a couple of things. Number one, it's important to remember that the boundary entropy is keeping track of degrees of freedom that are not really there in your theory. They're just sitting there. Sorry, they're just sitting there somewhere in the Euclidean past. Okay. So so these degrees of freedom are sort of integrated over to set up your state of CFT two. And so even if the boundary entropy is quite large, you're not actually adding any degrees of freedom. And so this, this sort of um, you know, dumb CFT uh, doesn't really get the boundary degrees of freedom to help it out. The boundary degrees of freedom are just helping to prepare the state. Um, the other thing I have to say is that the game isn't quite over yet based on this diagram. So I have a little bit more to say. Um, in fact, we, so we might be encouraged, maybe, you know, this is consistent with what you would probably think that it would be easier to use lots of degrees of freedom to, to mock up a state of a theory with less degrees of freedom and harder to mock up a state of a more complicated theory with a less complicated theory. Okay. But apparently, you know, as long as C2 is not too small, as long as it's not smaller than one third, um, then, then you can do it. Okay. Okay. But if that's possible, um, okay, so that, I think I just said that summary so far, you know, this state, it faithfully encodes a bubble of geometry dual to the vacuum, um, you know, as long as CF C2 is greater than C1, or for some range of C2, if uh, log G is large enough. Okay. Okay. But if you can do that, so, so let's say, let's say we have C1 and now, you know, we learned that I can actually use a CFT2 that's a little bit dumber in Raphael's language um, that maybe has half of the degrees of freedom or half the central charge as CFT1. And I can use that CFT2 and choose a state of it to, um, to encode the vacuum state of, of CFT1. Um, and now, uh, as I'll argue in a few slides, well, I could also choose other states of that to encode some other states of CFT1. Um, and so you can now imagine doing a trick where first I use CFT2 to encode the vacuum of CFT1. CFT2 has half of the central charge. Um, and now I try to approximate that state of CFT2 with CFT3, which has half of the central charge again. Um, and so that, that kind of gives you this picture where instead of doing it in one step, I start with a vacuum of CFT1, I apply my Euclidean quench to define a state of some CFT2, which, or CFT, I guess, N, which has a few less degrees of freedom. And then I keep doing this um, until I get down to CFT2, which has many fewer degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, so our preliminary results, and I, I don't want to be, I think we're still sort of checking this. Our preliminary results suggest that this actually works, that if you, if you, that maybe the problem before was just that the, the interface was too severe between CFT1 and CFT2 with many fewer degrees of freedom. But if you consider doing that quench in a number of steps where each step you don't decrease the central charge too much, then you can, um, you can actually approximate a state or, or a, a region of the, of the geometry dual to CFT1 with a state of CFT2 that actually has many fewer degrees of freedom. Mark? Yeah. Uh, there's one thing that I sort of lost track of, which is the issue of, I mean, there's this annulus picture, right? Yes. If you want to do really well at describing uh, in, in sort of, uh, uh, yeah, dressing up as the, as the other CFT, you want to be able to take the uh, annulus to be very thin so that you have a really big bulk region that's behaving that's like right. the other CFT. What controls this here? And do you have a yeah. control parameter that you can yeah. uh, dial? So it's... It's, it's basically just this, um, this just parameter, epsilon. epsilon. Oh, so oh, okay. if, if it works, so this is sort of for small epsilon, um, 
for small enough epsilon, if I can do it, then I could just continue to take epsilon smaller and the bubble will get bigger and eventually the bubble will become infinitely large as epsilon goes to zero. So provided that you're in the right range of, of this diagram, then you can take epsilon to zero and take your bubble to be as large as you want. Now, and one thing how is- How should I interpret, interpret your result for the case where you've just brought it down to central charge equals one? Yeah, so it's important to note that as I do that, so remember the other thing that's related to this parameter epsilon is the parameter mu, which governs the energy of the state. And so mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to do this, um, you know, what you find is that every time you do one of these steps, you have to go to a higher and higher energy state. Um, so you're kind of accessing more degrees of freedom by going to very high energies. Um, now, of course, I don't know if you can go all the way down to central charge one because, you know, our, obviously the holographic investigation breaks down. Um, but, you know, that would be the, the reason why it's not obviously impossible that if you allow yourself to put enough energy into your CFT with a small central charge, then you have access to, in principle, enough degrees of freedom to describe some low energy state of another CFT. Mark, do you have to worry about back reaction or th that's really not an issue here? So, uh, yeah, good question. So we are taking into account back reaction fully in the context of this, of this kind of simple model. Um, it's just that we're assuming that the, the thing only couples gravitationally and our whole setup is spherically symmetric. And so fully back reacted geometries only have one choice in terms of what they can be, which is, which is ADS Schwarz shield. Um, so the back reaction is kind of taken into account by, by um, you know, finding out how much of the ADS Schwarz shield geometry you get. So it's not like I just draw an ADS cylinder and put a probe brain on it. Um, I actually have, you know, a different amount of the ADS um, geometry here. And then I glue that on to some specific amount of this ADS geometry. And you can think of that, you know, losing or gaining space time as being to do with the back reaction of the brain. Okay, so I'm out of time. I, I'm, I'm just now summarizing um, that kind of in the context of the model, um, we seem to find that any CFT can encode the space time uh, dual to the vacuum state of any other CFT. Um, I'll just mention that of course, um, we could have also started with the same picture, but now add sources for various operators in the Euclidean path integral. Um, so if I add sources for various operators in the path integral, um, I can get very general states of my CFT1 that would correspond to very general space times, kind of arbitrary perturbations on top of that ADS. Um, I, could, I could describe using some sources. And then exactly the same construction works. I could then investigate the gravity side just by adding some sources that determine some boundary conditions for light fields on the gravity side. And so it seems that as long as I'm able to describe the vacuum as I have, then I'll also be successful in describing states which are perturbations of the vacuum, um, but, you know, assuming that the, the, the solution with the bubble of vacuum has uh, a finite amount lower action than the corresponding solution um, without a bubble, then I should be able to perturb it and still have lower action. Um, just, you know, quickly, we could also think about non bigger perturbations. Um, so I could think of a, a um, black hole geometry where I had two copies of CFT1 entangled with each other and then try to approximate that with, um, with taking one of the copies to be CFT2. Um, and again, the same trick should work. Now we're going to get geometries that approximate this two-sided black hole with a part of a two-sided black hole where one of the asymptotic regions is now uh, a different, uh, a black hole in a different theory. Um, and so, so this is sort of interesting because now, um, you know, the part of the behind the horizon geometry dual to CFT1 is sort of encoded in some other CFT. And this is sort of uh, reminiscent of, okay, it's, it's, I think, related to a puzzling feature of some of these recent discussions of evaporating black holes in ADS-CFT where, 
you have a holographic CFT coupled to a, an auxiliary system. And then people have noted that the entanglement wedge of the auxiliary system can include some region of behind the black hole horizon. Um, and this is sort of puzzling because this auxiliary radiation system could be, you know, some completely different theory than holographic, the holographic CFT you start with. And so how could, how could that be describing some region of the same gravity theory? So, you know, you can see that with this kind of construction, you could actually be describing um, the same gravity theory, but maybe somewhere in between there's this interface brain. Okay. Um, okay. So now that the actual summary of, of things we have suggested and none of these things that I'm now going to say, uh, have I, have I proved or, or even argued convincingly for, I've sort of found that, a simple model is consistent with the following statements that, you know, theories of gravity dual to CFTs um, that can be coupled non-trivially at interface are part of the same non-perturbative theory. Okay. And so then, it, you know, if, instead of different quantum gravity theories being dual to different CFTs, you would say that the different quantum gravity theories maybe would be dual to different equivalence classes of CFTs where two CFTs are part of the same equivalence class if you can couple them. And then, of course, an interesting question is, is there more than one class or is there just, you know, can you couple everything together and is there therefore just one theory of quantum gravity? Um, and then we argued that given CFT1 in some state which is dual to a particular space-time, then as long as CFT2 can be non-trivially coupled to CFT1, then we can find a state of CFT2, which is dual to a space-time that contains an arbitrarily large portion of this Wheeler-DeWitt patch. We give a particular construction of that state. Um, and kind of coming back to the original motivation, I think, um, you know, it's, it's consistent with this extreme holography idea that the holographic CFTs, the individual ones, are sort of more connected with the possibilities for what the asymptotic behavior of gravity could be in ADS space-time. Whereas maybe the quantum gravity itself um, or the, the dynamics of quantum gravity itself perhaps is associated with some more universal physics of quantum systems, like the entanglement structure and dynamics. Okay, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I guess I have another speculative question. So um, uh, you're kind of hinting at it, I think, at the end. One thing we'd much rather do, right, than mimic one ADS-CFT with a different ADS-CFT is mimic quantum gravity like in the real universe uh, with whatever we can find. Yeah. And uh, does this give us, I mean, this sounds like maybe there might be some new ways, uh, new avenues into that problem that this uh, might suggest. And there's a yeah. little bit different from flavor from your, your very nice paper with Brian and others uh, a little while ago, right. where the real universe kind of lived on a brain. Here it would right. be really just behind the brain, maybe. Is that possible? Yeah. I mean, I th I th okay. I, th I think this is certainly a direction that is very interesting to explore. I, I mean, one thing this suggests is that you know these these cause these sort of causal patches sitting in the middle of space time um, they're kind of less connected to individual CFTs or, or you know the vacuum state of specific CFTs. We we find that this sort of thing is a little bit more universal. It's something that that can live in if if this if all this is right um, this physics of a causal patch in a space time is something that can live in, in you know, your choice of, of CFT. And so, you know, describing maybe a closed universe where, where you have this, this patch glued to some other patch. Um, if, if we can understand more precisely where that patch is living, you know, what, what, what is the physics of, of either CFT1 or CFT2 or CFT3 um, that corresponds to that patch? Um, that should help us understand how to how to construct more general things. I think, absolutely. I have a quick question. Uh, yeah, 
Um, so I think you said this, but what happens to the state, the quench state, if you time evolve it with the Hamiltonian of CFE2? Does the bubble collapse in the bulk or? or... Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's look at, there it is. Um, yeah. So if you, if you look from the interior point of view, then it, it's basically going to collapse at some later time. But of course, it, it includes the entire causal patch of the original slice of the bubble. So you can, you can work out exactly what these trajectories are. And I think you know, that generally when it collapses, this is actually light-like, if I recall. But... OK, thank you. Uh, um, OK, one thing. You have a phase diagram. Can you show that? Like C one over C two is yeah. horizontal. Yeah, here it and is. You say for small epsilon, is there any epsilon dependence? Uh, as long as the epsilon is small, something like always like this, because there is nothing to compete probably. For. Well, yeah, I mean it. It seems that you know for some like in this range of parameters here, even if epsilon is small, then the you can have a situation where the uh, the geometry with two different layers is lower action. Um, now, one can also consider epsilon being not infinitesimal. And then there's another parameter. I mean, then the phase diagram is more complicated. Um, so yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, if you, don't, you, you can wait for in, in our paper, we'll have more complicated phase diagrams with, with various values of, of epsilon or mu. Yeah. yeah. Because if epsilon is kind of uh, have to go to zero, then it's kind of like cutoff physics, right? I mean, so you probably want to have some finite epsilon or something. Because I was yeah, I mean, saying like cut off, you can just claim that it's a different theory with different states. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think epsilon, yeah, epsilon is sort of the, the this determines the scale at which yeah. the kind of UV physics, which is yes. just there to make the state finite energy yeah. crosses over to the IR physics, which is trying to approximate CFT yeah. one. So it, you want the epsilon to be finite, right? Yeah. Is there any known analog to your situation to the Janus solution? The, the Janus solution? The yeah, so, exactly. So uh, I mentioned that there are some microscopic solutions that have been that have been worked out uh, for some cases. And uh, there, there's, you know, a, a very complicated set of type 2b supergravity solutions that preserve basically the symmetry of a super, like if you had n equals four, but on a half space or, or n equals four with another n equals four on, on the other side, then that preserves a certain um, subset of the super conformal symmetry. And so actually all half supersymmetric solutions of type 2b supergravity with that symmetry are known. And so these include, um, these include solutions with, which are dual to various kinds of interface CFTs that are, um, you know, n equals four with, with some value of parameters interfacing with n equals four with some other value of parameters. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you. This set of solutions also includes, you know, solutions dual to just n equals four with a boundary or three n equals fours all coming together somehow. There, and yeah, I think there are other examples as well, but yeah, people like Gut Pearl and Docker and others have, have studied these solutions in detail. Any more questions? If not, let us thank Mark again. <laughs>